Well, good morning, everyone. I want to welcome you along to our service this morning. Lovely to have you with us on the second Sunday of the new year. And uh, I know it's a miserable old day out there, but uh, you've all braved the elements. And uh, it's great to have you with us here in the building as we worship together. Uh, and it's great to have everyone um, who is watching on the live stream as well with us. Uh, as usual, we'll just begin with our contact tracing. So I'll take a photograph uh, of each side of the church. And now we've got a record of everyone who's here. Uh, the only announcement this week is uh, the free will offering envelopes are available in the vestibule. I know that most of you have already picked them up, but if you haven't, uh, please make sure that you get them as you're leaving. And if you don't have free will offering envelopes and you would like a set, then uh, please speak to me afterwards. Uh, I'll be out at the front uh, or speak to anyone in the vestibule and uh, we'll be able to get those organized for you. So today we're coming to worship God, and as we come to worship, we're thinking about what it means to live in exile. Exile is a, a term that's used in the Bible many, many times about Israel, and as it applies to the nation of Israel, it also applies to us as we live in this world today. Paul puts it like this in Philippians 3. He says, our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. So, in other words, we as followers of Jesus Christ are citizens of heaven. That's where our true home is. That's where we truly belong. And therefore, as we're living in this world, at times we feel a little bit uneasy. We don't feel as though we quite fit in with what's happening in the world. And the Israelites would look at that as being in exile. They longed to be in the promised land, but at times God removed them from that promised land. And they were in a foreign land under a foreign ruler, under foreign rules. And they were living in exile. And how did they cope with that? And that's what we're going to be thinking about this morning, how we live in this world that at times appears to be godless, appears to have forgotten God's laws and forgotten God's words. How do we follow Jesus Christ and how do we live for him in those circumstances? So let's come before God in prayer and let us pray together. Lord, we come to you this day to praise you because we know that it is good to sing praises to our God. We know that it is pleasant to come before you and offer you the worship of our hearts. And Lord, we declare today that you are the Almighty, the everlasting, the one who rules over all. Almighty God, we come to you today and we recognize, Lord, that as we bow in your presence, our hearts are open before you. You know our thoughts this day, Lord. You know our desires. Nothing can be kept secret from you. And therefore, Lord, we come to you confessing our sin and asking, Lord, that you would cleanse us in your presence. Cleanse our thoughts today, Lord. Cleanse our minds. Cleanse our hearts, Lord. And we ask that through your Holy Spirit, we might come before you and perfectly love you today. That through Jesus Christ, your Son, we might have our sins taken away and we might come before you and worship you as our Heavenly Father. Almighty God, because we are so weak in ourselves, we cannot even dare to stand before you today. And we recognize, Lord, that our enemies can come before us and drag us away from you. And therefore, Lord, we pray for your protection 
and we pray that you would keep us close to you today and indeed in this week ahead. Help us to trust you and help us to follow you. Lord, we thank you for your word today. You have told us, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy burdened, and you will give us rest. And Lord, we ask for your rest today. We pray that we might find peace and contentment in you. And Lord, in a world where we often struggle to fit in, we pray that you would help us as we seek to live for you and to follow you. So, Lord, we ask all these things today in and through your precious name. Amen. We're going to sing together, and uh, we're going to sing a hymn of praise where we praise the Lord God, the Almighty, who is the one who has created all things, the one who we come before Him uh, for our salvation, and we praise Him as our Redeemer today. So praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. And we're going to sing verses 1, 3, and 4, and we stand to sing, and I just remind you that we sing softly and quietly. Let's come before God in prayer and let us bring our prayers for others this morning. Lord God Almighty, we come to you because you are the one who deserves our praise. You are the King of creation. You're the one who brings salvation. The one in whom we trust. And therefore, Lord, we bring our prayers for others to you this morning. We come, Lord, once again with our minds and our minds uppermost, this pandemic and all that it means for our daily lives. And we pray, Lord, for those who are struggling day by day. We pray today, Lord, for those who have been uh, diagnosed with COVID, and we ask that you would be with them as they fight this disease and as they isolate. Be with them, we pray. 
We pray, Lord, for all of the frontline services. We think of health and education and security and all the other areas of life that are affected day by day when people have to isolate. And we ask, Lord, that you would watch over and that you would guide. We pray, Lord, for those who have the difficult decisions to make in the days ahead. And we pray that they would turn to you, the Almighty, and find help and find strength in you. Lord, once again, we want to thank you today that as a church family here, we are able to gather together. We thank you that we're able to gather here in person, and we thank you that also we are able uh, to gather remotely online. And so, Lord, we pray for your presence and your help and your guidance. We pray, Lord, that you would bless us as we worship you together. And we pray that we would know that you are here among us as the one true living God. Help us, Lord, in our daily lives to live knowing that you are the one who is in control of all things. And therefore, Lord, we worship you today. Lord, we recognize that COVID is uppermost in our minds, and yet there is so much else that is going on in the world, and we do not want to forget these things as well. We pray today, Lord, for our brothers and sisters throughout the world who are being persecuted for their faith and are in danger today if they seek to meet together. We ask, Lord, that you would protect them in many different parts of the world where it is such a danger just to say that they follow you. And so, Lord, we pray for them, and we pray, Lord, for those organizations that are seeking to help them. We pray for Open Doors and Release International and other such mission organizations. Lord, we continue to pray for the work of our World Development Appeal, and we remember Tear Fund and Christian Aid as they reach out uh, in practical ways with your good news and with practical help in Haiti and in Ethiopia and in many other parts of the world as well. So, Lord, we bring our prayers to you today, and we praise you because you are the one from whom all blessings come, and we rely upon you, and we trust in you this day. Amen. I thought it would be good today at the beginning of a new year for us to declare our faith in God and declare what it is we believe in and remind ourselves what it is we believe in. And so I've got the words of the Apostles' Creed on the screen in front of us, and I just thought we could take a moment or two to read it together and to declare what it is that we believe in Jesus Christ, in God the Father, and in the Holy Spirit. Uh, so there are three slides uh, with all the words on it, and we uh, end the final slide uh, ends with the word amen, so that you'll know that we're at the end of it. Uh, but just keep our seats and uh, just say it. You can say it out loud, but just nice and quietly uh, as we declare together our faith at the start of a new year. So just join me as we say the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried, he descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Amen. 
We're going to read together from God's Word now after we have uh, declared uh, and stated our faith together. And we're going to read today from Jeremiah chapter 29, uh, verses 4 to 14. And the prophet Jeremiah is writing a letter. This is a letter that he has written uh, to uh, the people of Israel. The people of Israel have been taken in exile to Babylon. Babylon, that great enemy of Israel, has come in and taken away many of the Israelites back to Babylon, and there they have been placed, and there they are living. And Jeremiah writes to them to tell them how they're to approach this new life in a foreign country with a foreign government and how they're to live each day. So this is what he says in in Jeremiah 29. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. Also seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it. Because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Yes, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Do not let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. They are prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my gracious promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I have banished you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile. Amen. And we pray that God will bless to us this reading of his word today. I always, at the end of a year, I always like to hear the announcement of the word for that year. Usually, end of December, the announcement is made, and some of the the dictionaries uh, choose a word to try and sum up what's happened in the previous year. In 2020, not last year, but the year before, the Oxford English Dictionary word for the year was unprecedented. And you remember what 2020 was like, and everything during that year was unprecedented. We hadn't, we hadn't encountered it before. We were hitting things for the first time as we came across the pandemic and lockdown and furlough and all those different things. And so they summed up the year with the word unprecedented. Pandemic, of course, was also a close contender. Now, this past year, 2021, uh, Oxford Dictionary have chosen the word vax, and Cambridge have chosen the word perseverance. 
And it's easy to see why they would choose the word vax because this past year has been the year of vaccinations where we've all been encouraged to get them. And perseverance, we can see, uh, was involved in our attitude towards the pandemic and what was happening. We'd have to persevere. We'd have to get through. But it's also connected with NASA and them sending the Perseverance rover, which landed on Mars and started to explore uh, that planet. So a couple of reasons why perseverance was chosen as the word for the year. Now, if I had to choose a word to sum up church life this last year, then I think the word that I would choose would be the word lament. Back in January, this time last year, we were in lockdown. We weren't able to meet together, so everything was online. But if you remember our services, we had four services in a row looking at the idea of lament. And I think lament was one of those things that was able to direct us and and get us through this past year. Throughout the year, I found myself going back to that whole idea of lament once again. And uh, in our church services, during our prayers of intercession, often I would follow that pattern of lament because we were coming to church and we were just uncertain. We didn't know what was happening, how we were going to get through, how things were changing before us. And so, we would come and lament before God. We would turn to Him. We would bring our complaints to Him. We would ask Him boldly, and then we would trust in Him for His answer. And lament also helped me on a personal basis throughout the year. Rather than despairing, Lament leads us to hope and points us back towards God again. Now, this morning at the start of a new year, I'm going to enter into the dangerous world of prediction. Now, if this prediction doesn't come true, then you can forget about it and don't cast it up to me whenever we get to December at the end of the year. But I'm going to make a a pitch for a word for this year. And who knows if this will be a word that stands the test of the 12 months, but it's a word that I think applies certainly now, and I can see it helping us in the weeks and maybe the months ahead. The word that I want to start off this new year with is the word exile. And I've mentioned it already in our service today. Now, maybe you're expecting something else. Maybe you would like to have something more positive, perhaps the the perseverance or resilience or a faith or a word like that would be better. And, And perhaps you might be right. But I want to suggest that exile is a word that hopefully will help us understand where we are and will help us then move forward and thrive in the situation that we're in. So, this morning we're going to look together at what exile is all about in the Bible, and then over the next few weeks we're going to go to the book of Daniel and the story of Daniel. It's a story that we all know from childhood. We know the big events in that book, and you could probably tell me some of them this morning and suggest some of the things that we're going to look at in the book of Daniel. But Daniel was someone who was living in exile, and yet he remained faithful to God, and yet he served God in a foreign land. So, let's begin with exile in the Bible. And exile is a theme that just runs right throughout the Bible. From the very opening of Genesis right through to the end of Revelation. It's not an exaggeration to say that the Bible deals with exile right throughout it. So what do I mean by exile? Well, if we go for a definition of exile, exile is the state of being barred from one's native country, typically for political or punitive reasons. So if you've been exiled then you are referred to as an exile. You've been removed from your own country. You're living in a foreign land. 
you no longer have the privileges that you once had as a resident of that country, and so therefore life is uncertain and life is difficult. The very first time that we see exile in the Bible is back in the Garden of Eden. You remember whenever Adam and Eve sinned, and they were banished from the garden. The garden was their home. It was a beautiful paradise where they lived with God. They walked with God in the garden. They talked to God face to face in the garden, and yet they sinned and they turned against God, and they were then exiled from the garden. They were banished from it. We read in Genesis 3, The Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. And he drove the man out. He placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword, flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. Eden was that perfect place of communion with God. And now Adam and Eve are exiled. They're exiled into a world that is sinful and a world that is hostile towards God. And God's great plan of salvation always centers around what happened in the fall in the Garden of Eden. Dealing with sin and restoring the the paradise that was lost at that time. And then right throughout the Bible, we see that similar pattern happening. Abraham is called, and he is promised a land to live in, a land that God is going to give him. And so he leaves his homeland, and he travels to the promised land. His descendants end up living in Egypt. And whenever they are in Egypt, they become slaves and they're held captive. And they spend many years in Egypt. They're exiled from their homeland. They long to get back to the promised land again. They want to get back where God intended them to be. And Moses was raised up by God, to take them back to that promised land again, to the place that God had prepared for them. They wandered through the wilderness for 40 years before they got back to the promised land, but eventually they were able to get back, and they settled there where God had a place for them. Now, whenever Israel was obedient then the nation prospered. But whenever they rejected God, the Babylonians invaded and carried them away into exile, into a foreign land again. So whenever they were obeying God, they were blessed, they were in the right place. Whenever they disobeyed, they were far away from God. Whenever they repented of their sin and they turned back to God, God brought them back to the land of Israel again. And whenever they were sinned, they they were taken away in exile. We've just spent a, a few weeks in the book of Ruth during Advent. And if you remember that story, Naomi and her family ended up in a self imposed exile. They decided to leave Bethlehem and they went to the foreign land of Moab and they lived there for a while. But Naomi always had that yearning to go back again to Bethlehem, to be back where God intended her to be. And so we see this throughout the Bible where any time someone is away from the promised land, there's a yearning to come back and to find God again. So I want us to ask the question today, are we living in exile today? With the coming of Jesus in Bethlehem, the earthly boundaries of countries are no longer really what matters. 
There isn't a physical place on earth that we are to return to or were to yearn for. After all, there are followers of Jesus right throughout the world in all the nations of the world. So there isn't one place that we long to be on this earth. All divisions that existed are now gone. Think of what Paul says in Galatians 3. He says, so in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. There's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. If you are all one in Christ Jesus, if you belong to Christ, then you're Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. And it's that promise that we long for. It's that promise that is the yearning that is in our hearts now. Not a yearning to go back to the land of Israel, but a yearning to be with Christ and to be with Him. Our yearning is the promised land, but that promised land is heaven, the new heaven and the new earth to be with God. And therefore, right now today, we are in exile because we're living in this land that isn't the new heaven and the new earth. We're living in a land where we're separated from God. We're living in a land that has rejected God and has turned away from God. And therefore, we have to adapt to this world that we're in. We're not in the land that we're supposed to be in. This world is foreign to us. That verse that we read at the beginning of our service today from Philippians, our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. I think the sad thing is that we'd almost convinced ourselves for a while that we were living in the promised land. We'd got very, very comfortable in this world. We thought that things were going the right way and that things were right before God. And we thought we had landed in the promised land and we were quite happy with that. For many, many years, on the whole, the laws of this land mirrored God's law. Everything was built upon God's Word, and people seemed to be, even if they weren't committed to Jesus Christ, they were living under His laws, and they accepted His laws. We'd kept the evils of hypocrisy and ritual at bay, and we were able to stand up for the truth in this land. But over the last number of years, something has changed. We are living in a foreign land now. God's Word is no longer guiding everyone in today's society. The rules of the land are no longer based on God's Word. It's as though that foundation of God's Word has been pulled out and nothing has been put in its place. And so therefore, things are beginning to crumble around us. And we're saying to ourselves now, this isn't the promised land. I don't feel as if I fit in here anymore. There's something wrong. How am I supposed to live for Jesus in a world that has gone so badly awry? Physically, we are still living in the same place. It's not like an Old Testament exile where we've been plucked and put in a foreign land. But spiritually, we have been carried far, far away. It's almost as though we've woken up in a different land. We look around us and we hardly recognize the place that we're living in now. If we look back 10, 20 years, it was a different land. Things were very different. The laws have changed. They're no longer based on God's Word. And everything is wobbling, falling apart. Things that we regard as being true and unquestionable 
are now being regarded as old-fashioned in this world, out of date. It's certainly not the promised land that we're living in. To quote that great theologian, and uh, maybe you have been thinking this already as I've been speaking this morning, if you're of a certain age, to quote that great theologian Jim Reeves, this world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. I don't base all my theology on Jim Reeves, but you know the song. We have that same feeling that the Israelites had whenever they were taken captive. Do you remember Psalm 137? In Psalm 137, whenever I tell you the words of it, you'll think of another song possibly this morning. But in Psalm 137, they're far away from Israel. They have been taken captive and they're now in Babylon. And in Babylon, they're finding it difficult to cope. They're depressed, they're sad at the situation they see around themselves. They're worried that they're going to forget what God had given to them back in Israel. They're worried that they're going to get so comfortable in Babylon that they've forgotten about the promised land and about what's happening. And so in Psalm 137, they sing, by the rivers of Babylon, we sat and wept when we remembered Zion. There on the poplars we hung our harps, for there our captors asked us for songs. Our tormentors demanded songs of joy. They said, sing us one of the songs of Zion. How can we sing the songs of the Lord while in a foreign land? If I forget you, Jerusalem, May my right hand forget its skill. May my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth. If I do not remember you, if I do not consider Jerusalem my highest joy. Whenever we look around at what has happened to society over the last 5, 10, 20 years, how can we sing? How can we sing of the Lord whenever we see His name misused so much? How can we sing of the Lord whenever we see His laws and His word being disregarded so much? What happens if we forget what the promised land is like? If we forget that there's more than this world to come? If we forget about the new heaven and the new earth? The Israelites who were singing this psalm said, look, if we forget what God has in store for us, then it would be better if we forgot how to play our instruments. It would be better if we could no longer sing because that is what is important to us and that is what we have got to sing about. So then, how do we live in exile? What's the plan? If we are in exile today, what do we do? Well, there are a number of different approaches. You, the first option, I suppose, is to resist. We can fight everything that goes wrong. We can protest at every decision that has gone against God's Word. We can batten down the hatches and we can maintain some degree of decency. And we can lock out the world and have a lovely little private enclave where we hold on firmly to God's Word. The second option is simply to give in accept that we're in exile, and adopt the Babylonian way of life. Reject the truth of God's Word and accept the popular opinions that are put before us. 
accommodate the ways of the world into our worship and into our lives. But neither of those options are really very helpful. Protesting doesn't really seem to get us very far in today's world. We're just ignored. In fact, we become caricatures of what we believe in, and nobody listens anymore. Accommodating doesn't help either because then we lose our voice completely. Our message makes no sense because our lives just begin to look like everyone else's. So if we can't resist and we can't give in, how are we to live in exile today? What do we do? Well, Jeremiah had another option that we read together from Jeremiah 29. And it may surprise you, it may even shock you what Jeremiah wrote to the Israelites. But we read it earlier from Jeremiah 29. The Lord says, if you are in exile, get on with life. You can't force yourself out of exile. When the time is right, you will come out. But in the meantime, here is what I want you to do. Seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. We're to seek the peace and prosperity of the world that we live in. This is how God wants us to honor Him. And whenever we do that, we will honor God, and then we too will prosper. It seems to go against everything that comes naturally to us. We don't want to seek the peace and prosperity of the world around us whenever it is so much against God's Word. And yet that is what Jeremiah suggests to the Israelites And indeed, that is what some did. Now, is there anyone in the Bible who follows this command and who gives us an example of what it looks like? Well, perhaps the best example that we can find is Daniel. We're going to look at Daniel over the next few weeks together. Daniel is taken captive into Babylon. King Nebuchadnezzar invades Israel and takes the the cream of the Israelites into captivity and takes them back to Babylon. There, Daniel and his friends are enrolled into a three-year training program. The idea of that three-year training program is, I suppose, to brainwash them. Nebuchadnezzar wants them to forget about Israel, to forget about God, and to become fine, upstanding citizens of Babylon. He wants to reprogram them, as it were, so that they forget about Israel and they put all their effort into living for Babylon. But Daniel doesn't forget. He doesn't forget about Israel. And he doesn't forget about God. Jeremiah in his letter said, you're going to be there for 70 years. So build houses, plant gardens, eat the produce of the gardens. But seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. And so Daniel is an example of how to live in exile of how to remember God when society has forgotten Him, how to obey God's Word when society is disobeying it, how to follow God when nobody else is. So although exile may sound like a terrible place to be, Although exile may sound negative at the start of a new year, 
I think over the next few weeks, we're going to discover that we can turn to God, we can obey His Word, we can follow Him, even though society may not be, and we can seek His blessing and receive His blessing in the year ahead. So as we lament what is happening around us, let's live in exile and find God's blessing. Let's bow before Him in prayer. Lord God Almighty, we come to You today, and although, Lord, we are living in exile, although, Lord, we live in a world that has rejected You, is disobeying you, has forgotten you. And Lord, at times we despair whenever we think about how this world has turned away from you. We thank you, Lord, that you have given us many examples in your word of those who lived in exile, those who lived faithfully, those who still followed you and obeyed your word. And we pray, Lord, that over the next few weeks, we might learn from Daniel, that we might dare to be a Daniel, as it were, and follow your commands, obey your word, and live here, Lord, in a way that would seek peace and prosperity and blessing from you. For Lord, we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to end our service today by singing, O oh God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come. As we look back at the example in God's Word of how He's been faithful to us, as we even look back over our own lives and discover how God has been with us, we then look to the future and how He will lead us and guide us. We sing verses 1 and 2 and verses 5 and 6. So let's stand to sing together. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, both now and forevermore.
Please be seated. Once again, thank you very much for coming today. And as usual, we'll be leaving from the rear pews first. Uh, so just wait until Francis uh, gives you an indication uh, when to leave. So thank you. Thank you.